Well, today we're talking about relationships. And this whole series, we're going through the book of Ephesians, which is an amazing book of the Bible. We've been going through it line by line, verse by verse. And when we get to chapter 5, we get into relationships. We've been talking about it. Now we're in chapter 6. We talk about husbands and wives and the place in the home. Now we're t- we talked about children's responsibility last week. And now today we're talking about how to raise kids. You're like, oh, I can check out right now. I don't have any kids. I don't want any kids. I had them, did that. I don't even wear the T-shirt. I don't want anything to do with it. Well, listen, everybody, we are a, we're a biblical community, and we help each other out. And so these principles will work whether you have children or not, because everyone has responsibility over somebody, right? And one of the hallmarks and the foundation stones of society is the family. And so we're going to be talking about that today. All right, is that good, everybody? Now, so you need to pay attention. I also understand some of you are single parents, Some of you are divorced. Some of you are estranged from your children. And I understand that. But listen, everybody, God is a God of order. God is a God of new beginnings. And I'd seen single moms and single dads do a great job raising their children. And so God can give you grace for that. But however, we do need to tell you what God's ultimate design is and what works best in its proper context. I've seen single moms and single dads do better jobs than a husband and wife. It doesn't mean that you don't need a husband and wife working together, a father and a mother working together. So we're not against that. We're just telling you what God's design is. Remember, everybody, God loves us. He loves you. You matter to God. And he wants the very best for you. He really does. And so everything in the Bible is not there to limit your freedom. It's to give you more freedom. We have this mirage thinking that if we go against God's design, it will give us more freedom. It doesn't work too good. Have you noticed? God put these things in order for a reason. So I'm still in process. Sandra and I are still in process. We still have children. We have Matthew, who is 12 years old, soon to be a teenager. We have uh, Luke, who is a teenager, and Hannah, who is a teenager. And uh, I have to be honest with you, when I, when, before I had children, I was an expert about how to raise kids. <laughs> I had an opinion about everything, and I was right. <laughs> You would not have liked me back when I was in my late teens and early 20s. I had an, I had an answer for everything. And I had a very, you know, and then, and then uh, in my 20s, I still thought I knew how to parent. I can't believe they're doing that. Then my wife and I got married. I was still an expert at raising kids. Then we had our first child. And I was pretty good still. And so I would criticize people that had teenagers. I can't believe they let their kids do that. And then I had teenagers. It's humbled me. In fact, you know, I, I wonder sometimes what God, what God, what God had in mind. Because I, I just think that uh, I think sometimes I think the Lord was looking down from heaven one time and, and said, I think looking down from heaven said, "Let's see how we can take revenge on mankind." And so He made teenagers. Think about it. He says, I wonder how it would be if, if, I wonder how it would be, see how they like it, that the person that created them, they deny their existence. And so that's kind of what teenagers do, right? And in fact, I was wondering, you know, I've read the Bible from front to back many times, and it never tells you how old the devil was when he rebelled. I suspect he was 16. Got that from a friend. I didn't do a very good job with it. We'll move on. Okay. Spirit-empowered relationships. We're talking about spirit-empowered relationships because, my friends, I don't know about you, but I've tried to run my relationships by myself. I, I do well for a while, but I mess up. I need something beyond myself. I need God's presence in my life to help me to love you, to love my wife, to love the children that God has given me, right? And the most difficult relationships you and I face are the people that we're closest with. They're the, they're the ones that we love the most and we get hurt the most. We can fake it outside. We can fake it at work. We can fake it at church. But man, when you're living with somebody, it's, it's hard to fake, right? When you have your children at home, right? And so how do we raise godly kids? And we should be helping everyone out with this. Raising God's children God's way. It's by the Spirit. 
So I wanted to help you guys understand. I know we're living in a crazy world today, and I understand that, and you can get overwhelmed by what's going on in the world today. You really can be. You just, all you have to do is like, let me, just, let me just forget about all that. But God has made it abundantly simple. We have to keep our focus on Jesus Christ. He is the author, and he's the completer of our faith. So since he's the author and the completer, and he sent us the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth, to guide us and empower us, then the only way you and I can really have good relationships, ultimately, is by being submitted to God and by the power of his spirit that we have spirit-filled, spirit-empowered relationships. So in Ephesians, I'll just kind of give you a little bit of context, a little bit of a review. Is that okay, everybody? Hang on for a few moments. Okay, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, making the best the use of your time because the days are evil. Can we not agree that the days are evil? How do we handle these evil days? Well, this is what the Word of God says. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What's God's will for my life? You want to hear it? Here it is. Here it is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. And so I need the Holy Spirit right now while I'm talking to you. Holy Spirit, addressing... One another. So, again, one of the ways we overcome, one of the ways we become stronger is we address one another in the Spirit of God. That you encourage me, I encourage you. That together, each of us are missing elements of our life. I have deficits. You have deficits. I have things you don't have. You have things that I don't have. But when you and I work to complete each other, instead of competing against each other, we become stronger. And it's my prayer that we're seeing it happen already, that Cornerstone Church, this local fellowship, that we would be a place that competes that completes each other does not compete against each other. That when you see someone get a pay raise, you thank God. When someone else gets a, their children do great, you thank God. We work together, right? We understand that we all need God, and we're not trying to one-up each other. How much better would that be, everybody? This is kind of a community that lends itself to a spirit-infused Holy Spirit relationship. So addressing one another, that's why we need each other. In psalms and hymns, that's what we did this morning, spiritual songs, Singing and making melody with the Lord in your heart. Then we jump to verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That you and I are called to submit to each other. Sometimes I have to forgo my mission to help you with yours. That's what Jesus did. He left heaven to come to our level to help us out. He submitted himself to our level to help each other out. It isn't all about me. And when you begin to really function in the capacity where you're helping other people and you're not doing it for yourself, there's something inside of you that goes, yes, it's your design, right? Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, one of the things that are really important is we talked about the Trinity. I, we're not going to go into today, but there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We remember, mentioned a few weeks ago, some of you talk to yourself while you're driving. Okay, well, how can you talk to yourself? Because you have a body. You have a soul and you have a spirit. So you're not crazy. You're made in the image of God. So you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're all three of the same value, but they have different function within that value. And while they work together, right, God the Father is the one that they submit to ultimately, but they submit to each other. And so in the household, we also have submission that we are co-heirs working together. So, so we have God, all relationships are that way. So submission is the key to all relationships. Sometimes I have to submit to, to my wife and, and let go of my desires to meet her needs, to be a servant to her, and she submits herself to me. We submit to each other in godly fear that we're made in the image of God, and we should be submitting to each other as well. But there's also an order in the home that God has given us in its proper sequence. So today we're going to be talking about, are you guys ready? We're going to be talking about children. So here we go. We talked about children last week, the children's role. Now we're going to talk about the parental role. Okay, this is last week. The parents are like this one. They enjoy this one. You're not going to like the next one as much. Okay, children, obey your parents. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. In the Lord, for this is right. That's right. That's right. Honor your mother and father. This is the first commandment with a blessing, that it may go well with you and that you may live long on the land. And today, here we go. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. But bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So we're going to look at that right now. What does that actually mean? What does it mean to do that? Well, first of all, let's start with fathers. Why doesn't it mention mothers? 
Please understand the culture they, that the Bible was written. It was in a Greco-Roman context. Okay, you have to understand that men, women had zero rights. I'm sorry to tell you, everybody, they had zero rights. The man had complete rights. In fact, when the baby was born, the father could choose to say, I don't want the child, and the wife would have to give it away. But it was not God's design. It was the culture of that day, a very self-serving culture. And so children had very little rights at all. In fact, children were like, do what you want with the kids. You can beat them up. You can kill them. It doesn't make a difference when they're babies. You could literally say, I don't want it. And that's what they did in China for a long period of time. They only had a one-child policy. The government, the evil, that was evil. And so a lot of people would, would basically abort their female babies or give them up. And so now in China, there's a deficit of males. There, I'm sorry, there's a deficit of females. There's not enough women for the Chinese men to marry because they mess with God's created order. And so we see that happening, not respecting God's created order. He created them both male and female, and he called it what? Good. So the Bible starts off talking about fathers, and it also includes mothers in a situation within the context of parenting. But God has made the man supposed to be the spiritual head of the house, the priest. Basically, in the home, the man's supposed to be Jesus who sacrificed himself and died for his bride, the church, his wife. That it's not about him, it's about serving his wife, willing to die for his wife. That is the image we have of husbands and wives, and that's why we believe husbands and wives are a biblical model that God has set up, or he would have never talked about himself as an illustration of both man and female. You take that model away, you're distorting what God's view is. So fathers, okay, you guys, you guys get me here? This is pretty amazing. Pretty amazing within this context, but in the Jewish culture, it was a lot different. <laughs> they, they loved their children. They didn't throw their children. They didn't kill their children. It was forbidden to do that. They were not allowed to sacrifice their children to Moloch, but that's what they would do. They would follow the practices of the surrounding communities, but it was never God's intention. Both male and female have tremendous value. Children are a gift from God. The Bible says children are a blessing. God blesses uh, whose, man, whose quiver is full of children. They're like well-choiced arrows. The Bible talks about, about children and gives great value to them compared to the surrounding cultures. And it's always God gave value to both male and female. And you can see that throughout Scripture. So the first thing it says is fathers, but it also means husbands and wives. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Now, what does it mean to provoke? What does it mean to provoke? What it means to provoke is to, is to do something to your child to make them upset. Well, look, what happens all the time? Well, hang on for a second. I, I heard of a, somebody uh, that I knew a number of years ago when their child broke a vase. Or a, is it a vase or vase? Which one is it, everybody? How many for vase? How many for vase? Okay. Here's another one that bothers me. Is it pecan or pecan? I want to know this. How many is it pecan? Okay. How many is pecan? Okay. The pecan are more sophisticated. So if you're a pecan person, you're the upper echelon of society. If you're a pecan, what can I say? What does it have to do with this? Absolutely nothing. What was I talking about? I don't know. Children do not provoke, parents do not provoke your kids to anger. And so what happened was they, the child broke the vase. I call it a vase. The child broke the vase. Okay, and the child was like seven years old. So the boy went to bed that night. The parents got home. They were very upset that he did that because he's been breaking things. So they wake the child up at 10 p.m., get him out of the bed, and, and spank him with the belt. The child has no idea what's going on. It was awakened from its sleep. And it was beaten or it was spanked, and it was yelled at. Now, how's that child gonna adjust to that? You're sleeping in your bed and your parent punishes you. That's wrong. That's provoking the child to anger. You may be upset, and if you did something like that, you should ask for forgiveness for the child. This is kind of what happens, right? Or you, you tease a little child. I heard of another, another pastor who, when he was a boy, he had a little leather pouch and he would collect coins. He loved to collect coins. He was so excited about all the coins he collected, and he got this new leather pouch. And he wanted to show his father. His father comes home at night. He says, hey, Dad, hi, Dad. Well, get out of my way. And he says, Dad, look at this. He takes the leather pouch, 
and throws it outside the door into, into the bushes, and the boy can't find it. I heard of another child there where the son had an iPod, and, uh, and the father spilt oil all over it from the, from the salad, and he yelled and spanked his son for that. And the father did it. And here's a 30-year-old man telling me that story. Still remembers it today. Now, unfortunately, we've all made mistakes. Sometimes we say things, we do things, you don't understand the power we have. But that's provoking your child to anger. That's provoking your child to anger for no reason, right? That's wrong. That's abuse. We're not called to do that. You've realized that, you know what, children are made in the image of God, and that those are God's children, and I have a responsibility to take care of that child, and I'm going to be held responsible how I raise that child. So what does it mean to provoke? One of the ways is unjust punishment provokes anger. I mean, listen, everybody, I, I, I've seen it happen. <laughs> someone told, a number of years ago, someone told me that their daughter got into the nail polish in the bathroom and spilt it all over, everywhere, got it everywhere, and the mother came home, and, and first of all, she was irate, and then she began to laugh. She said, you know what? Things happen, right? But, we, you know, we've seen it happen. You spill the, spill the milk. You idiot. What? You're such a klutz. There you go again, you're klutz. So when you speak something like that, it gets in your kid's mind, and your mind go, their mind goes, I'm a klutz, and I screw things up, and so I break things. And guess what they start doing? They start breaking things. There, there, there was, a, there was a, a, young man in, a young man in our church uh, who grew up as a teenager, and he got accused of stealing something in the church. He didn't even do it. So they punished him like he stole it. And as a result of that, he went into rebellion against the church. It wasn't until years later he recognized that what happened. So that's provoking children, okay, to anger. It's not right. We don't want to be doing that. So what does that actually mean? Well, inconsistent and unclear discipline provokes anger. So when you, when you discipline a child, the child needs to know what the problem is, okay? For example, you break the vase while eating the pecan pie. <laughs> Excuse me. You break the vase while eating the pecan pie. So what happens then? The child's sleeping. Uh, why don't you wait till the next day? The child gets up. And then sit little Junior down and say, hey, listen, Junior, listen. Uh, last night while you were eating your pecan pie, you were playing with your figures, your action figures, and you, you, you actually hit the vase and it broke. I want to let you know, we told you, did we not tell you not to have toys at the table? And we're doing that. Yes, Mommy. Yes, Daddy. Okay. Listen, that's wrong. You see what happened as a result of that. I'm going to let you know right now, we take care of things in this house. And when mom and dad say no toys at the table, it's for reasons like that. Do you understand? Yes, mommy. Yes, daddy. Okay. The next day happens. They're having pecan pie. And he's there again. He brings a toy out. Hey, Junior, what did I just tell you? Okay. You're going to, okay, you're going to go sit in the corner or whatever. You see, you have to explain inconsistent and unclear discipline. The child needs to know what the, what the parameters are. Then you can discipline the child. Does that, that make sense, everybody? You know? So unjust punishment provokes people to anger. Or how about this? You're trying, to, you're trying to make the child in your own image. You always wanted to be the captain of the cheerleading team. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but suppose you were. I'm just kidding. So you want to be a football player. You want to be a ballerina, whatever you want to be. And, and, and you want your child to become that. So you, you put your child, and your child is terrible. They have two left feet. They can't, they're so unphysical, but they can play the violin amazingly. Or they're amazing artists. Well, I, want to, I want my son to be a jock, not a painter and a philosopher. Or well, maybe the opposite. You see, the best thing you can do, I'm very happy. My parents never forced me to go into ministry. I'm very happy about that. It was something that was my own choice that I, that parents never forced me to go to Bible school. They never forced me to read my Bible or pray. They never forced me, but they put me in circumstances where it was around me and I could participate in that if I wanted to. But they always put me. In fact, I don't know if you realize this, everybody, but you may not know me, but I used to have a drug problem when I grew up, uh, a really bad drug problem. In fact, my drug problem was so bad that it's still in my blood today. It still controls me. Um... I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I was, I was drugged to church. I was drugged to school. I was drugged to the doctors. I was drugged to the orthodontist and had that horrible thing around my head. But because I was drugged, my parents put me in places 
where it put me in situations where I could receive the instruction and admonition of the Lord, and I thank God every day that I was drugged as a kid. Some of you need to start drugging your kids in the right directions. So this is part of it. Inconsistent and unclear discipline provokes anger. So we have to be clear what we expect from them. Then hold them accountable. And that takes work, right? That takes work. We're going to break this down. And, and, and also, you don't want to correct your kids in anger. It's hard. When you're angry, and this happened to me. I mean, the, there was one instance in my life where uh, one of the children did something pretty bad. And when I, when, when I saw that, I reacted for several reasons. Number one, I'm the youngest in my family. And my older brother, David, who I can talk about now, used to pick on me. He used to tickle me till I cried and kept on tickling me. Then he'd go like that on my face. And he put his elbows in my arms. He was horrible. So he should be incarcerated. No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> so he would like, he would do that. So there was an incident where one of my children, the older child, was doing something against the youngest one. And what happened is I had, a, I had a flashback when I was a kid, and I laid into that child like you would not believe. I, I, you know, I had a right to be upset, but I went beyond. And so he now is in a more, more no, I'm just kidding. Nothing happened like that. <laughs> but I acted in a way I had to apologize. I literally called my parents and asked them to pray for me, and I wanted to enroll myself into counseling. I was that upset how I acted. How can me, a pastor, act this way? And I recognized the problem was I was, I was superimposing my childhood on, on my son who did that. You, know, you follow what I'm saying? What he did was wrong, and he should be corrected, but I overdid it. And I, I had to humble myself. I had to go to my child and ask for forgiveness. And to this day, it's still, I still get a lump in my throat when I think about it. Thankfully, he doesn't remember it because he was unconscious. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Inconsistent and unclear discipline provokes anger. Here's the one I heard. I don't know who came up with this, but I heard it from Josh McDowell. It wasn't from him. This is a phenomenal. If you want to get this etched in your mind, get this, get this branded in your mind, whether you're a parent or not. Rules without relationship equals rebellion. If you're pushing Christianity on your kids, rules, 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 rules. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this. You can't do that. Welcome to First Can't Church. It's all about can't, 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 can't. No, it's about rules without relationship equal rebellion. And this happens in the workplace too. If you don't spend time, this, I've been guilty. If you don't spend time with the people you're working with and you keep barking out commands, they're going to start feeling like, what am I, a slave? You have to have relationship with people. You have to invest relationship. So rules without relationship equal rebellion. And that's why we, we tell people all the time, get to know God. Love God. Love God. Uh, submit to God. Don't worry about all the rules. Just love God, and he'll show you what to do. So rather than talk about the rules, we rather begin with relationship. Do the rules matter? Absolutely the rules matter. The rules keep you on the road of relationship. They're like guardrails. They're like a, the lines on the road. You start neglecting those lines, you go off the end of the road, you crash your car, now you're off the road of the relationship. So the rules are a means to keep you with that relationship. But the rules are not the end. They're a means to help you with the relationship. Make sure that you teach children that, that it's not about, oh, you've been a bad boy, God's going to be angry. No, it's about relationship. And the reason why God gets angry when we sin is because he loves us and doesn't want to see us destroy ourselves. Not because, oh, I don't want them having fun. God forbid. Well, I forbid. You know, come on. <laughs> Rules without relationship equals rebellion. Fathers do not provoke your children, but bring them up in the what? Discipline. You know what it means to be a disciple? Discipline's good, everybody. You can't be your child's best friend. I want to parent my kids so they're going to like me when they're 30. You may not like me right now, but one day you're going to appreciate me. And I, I will say this, and if Luke's watching this, Sandra and I were greatly, greatly, greatly blessed because I, I have to be transparent with you. When I sent Luke off to college, I kind of recollected everything I did, and I'm like, man, I, went, I fell short. I, could, I should have done this, 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 and the other. I started thinking, oh, man, I spent too much time at the church, none of time with my son. 
And I started beating myself up a little bit. I'll be honest with you. The devil's like, you're just a bad dad. I'm just a bad dad. You're not, you didn't do enough. I didn't do enough. And I started feeling bad for myself a little bit. Be honest. I'm just being, listen, I'm a human being. And I got a text from my son, Sandra and I, and he just thanked us for raising him godly. And we, we just wept. I mean, I, we we're so, I'm like, God, I don't know how you were able to use me as imperfect as I am to help my son come to know you. And so I was blessed by that. You see, and so don't beat yourself up. We all make mistakes, but God is bigger and he's greater than your mistakes. Own your mistakes. Atone, like, let the, own them, let the Lord atone them, and, and get, get right and forgive. Ask for forgiveness and make it right. Okay, we're on, and so in our household, you know, that's an old program, Daddy's old, um, Father Knows Best. Yeah, the father, the father makes that mistake, and I ask for forgiveness. I actually ask my children for forgiveness. You know what? I was wrong how I treated your mother. I actually ask for forgiveness. They see us do that. We're not perfect. So bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It's, it's, I don't, I'm so glad I didn't grow up in the age of this. I mean, I had to work hard to be bad. I did. I had to work hard to be bad. Today, within two milliseconds, your child can be anywhere in the world looking at anything. Parents, it's extremely difficult to manage these things. The parental controls, and you can try all you want, but they got friends. Don't look at the iPhone. Don't look at the iPhone. Don't look at the iPhone. And one of the things, big things I'll just say is pornography is a big problem in our culture today. Huge problem. It's all over the place. So talk to your kids about it now. They're going to see it, unfortunately. I don't care if you're a Pen it's a Pennsylvania or Dutch. You'll still see it somehow. It's everywhere. So tell them, listen, God made sex. It's a beautiful thing. But the pornography, what it does, it just distorts it, and it actually does brain damage. It actually does messes with you. So tell them the truth. It messes with your head. It's what it does. Tell them about what it does. My parents told me about drugs and what it did, and I saw people in drug you know, a drug addicts and all that, and like, you know what? You want, no, no thank you. I was afraid of drugs as a kid. I, I have never, I, I have no desire for drugs. I have no desire to get drunk. I've seen it growing up. And so tell your children the truth about sex. Sex is a wonderful thing in marriage. It's God's gift, but don't be looking at pornography. It messes with your mind. It will ruin your relationship. Tell the kids those things. You don't have to tell them everything you did, because if you, t by the way, this is a little secret. If you tell your children everything that you did, they'll think it's okay that they do it. You can tell them when you're older, not when they're young. Well, my mom and dad did that. My dad was an ax murderer. He's still here. No. <laughs> no. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. So bring up them in, in the in way of the Lord. You know, something else I want to bring to your attention that I don't think we're aware of. And this is, again, this is, this is a much sociological research said this. Kids who become active Christ followers. If you want your children to grow up to be Christ followers, here's some things I want to bring to your attention. If mom and dad went to church, 72% of the children will as adults and have a relationship with God. If mom only went to church, 15% of the children would do it as adults. If dad only went, 55%. If neither mom and dad went, 0 0.06. Now, the, these are just studies, the countless studies about the roles of fathers and mothers in the household. And why it's so important that we raise our kids in, in the Lord. Guys, let me just tell you something right now. Your kids go to school, do they not? I think it's important they go to church. Not because I'm the pastor. Even if I'm not the pastor of this church, they, they need to see you worshiping. They need to know it's important to put God first. And so we're working right now to see what we can do to even make a, do a better impact upon our children. That our children within four years will know the whole Bible. They'll memorize 48 Bible verses. We're looking to see to revamp our entire children's ministry. That the children could come out knowing God, but you know what? You can't give them an hour and week and think we're going to solve the issue. You see, this is what happened. Let me explain to you. Uh, for most of human history, husbands and wives worked together. Either they were farmers or they were blacksmiths or whatever they did, right? That's what happened. Families worked together. Husband and wives were partners. Then we had the first industrial revolution, and then we had the second industrial revolution. Now, in the Industrial Revolution, you had factories and things of that nature. So now the man would leave the home and be gone. Now the mother, the wife, had to take the responsibility of the father and the mother. Is there any? Do you see why the women's lib movement came up? 
They had to be the father and the mother. And the father would come home. He's exhausted. He was not trained. So he had multiple generations that way. So now you pretty much have an absentee father. He's there. Hey, guys, how you doing? Pat him on the back. Goodbye. And that's what happens. That's what happened in our culture, right? But that's not the way we're supposed to parent our culture. Now today in the modern age, now we have both parents working. And now basically what we do is we're like CEOs. Okay, we're going to... What we're going to do is we're going to hire somebody to teach them how to, do, how to have good uh, sportsmanship. We'll put them in the sports league. We'll put them in the math club. We'll put them in this or the other, right? We're going to go put them in judo or karate or taekwondo or uh, whatever, uh, MMM fighting, whatever you guys do. <laughs> you might get arrested for that, but don't do that. Um, so you put them in all these various things, right? And, and so now we're subcontracting our children to be brought up in church. All of a sudden, the church will get saved instead of spending time with them. Children are not machines. They're human beings that require time. Our culture will tell you it's all about making the buck. No, you're better off, in my opinion, having a smaller house, driving an older car, and spending time with your children than you are having the latest and the greatest. Because when you die one day, you're not going to be thinking, man, I should have had that new iPhone. I have a flip phone. You'd be better off with a flip phone and have your children love you then one day they're saying, my mom and dad were never there for me. I'm just telling you. I got to bring them to Disney. I got to bring them to Disney. I got to spend, you know how much it costs to go, to, I'm going to get me started, but <laughs> I got to bring them to Disney. So you work all these hours and you go away for a week and they don't see you for the whole rest of the year. You're better off going to Kwasi <laughs> and spending time with them. We have all this stress. I'm going to tell you, to be a, living in Cheshire is tough. Everyone is on these professional uh, athletics clubs. I mean, everyone, ha- you have a coach for this, a coach for that. And you can, I kid you not, I could literally have my children gone 50 hours a week just on sports alone, having a, having a catching coach and a t- tennis coach and this and the other, and the, uh, computer programming, a taekwondo, MMA, and all these things. I, I'm working on the MMA. Okay. But bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Love them like Christ loved you, right? God loved you while you were yet sinners. What? Christ died for you, right? Love is spelled time. Hey, listen, we need to wrap this up here today, but let me just say a couple of the things with you. This is our, this is our goal. You hear it, everybody? When the baby's born, living nine months in the mother's womb, the first thing you have to do to raise that child is what? Cut the umbilical cord. And you'll keep on cutting that umbilical cord until they leave the house. Our job is to help them be self-sustaining adults relying on Jesus Christ. That's our job. And if I've done that, I've done my job. And so I'm, I like this statement. Is gradually transfer a child's dependence from you to God. That's our job. What does that look like? Well, let me just read a couple of verses here. In Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 2, it says this. These are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy. And you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord. Your God means respect. As long as you live, if you obey all his decrees... And commands, remember, those those, those decrees and commands are to keep you on the road of relationship. But don't make the rules more important than God. Is that clear, everybody? Because that's legalism, and that's that's satanic. It is. Legalism is satanic. We have to focus on relationship with God, and the rules are means to help us get there. So you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. And you must commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again. Tell your children, right? Your children, talk about them. Excuse me, read this again. Repeat them again and again. This is what I tell my children all the time. I love you, I love it. But guess who loves you more? God. And to this day, I'll tell my son who's 19, Luke, you know I love you. Who loves you more? God. They got that branded in their head. Repeat them again and again to your children. I tell them, you've been made for God for a purpose. And God loves you, Right? Talk about them when you're at home. And when you're on the road, driving them to school, put the phone away, including you and the podcast. You don't need to hear with that. Talk to them. Put that phone. And at the dinner table, for God's sakes, 
Put the phone away. Take it off the table. It's been studies after studies. Families that eat together stay together and have at least minimum of three to four meals a week without the phones. And I tell my kids, get off the phone. Oops. Right? Remember growing up and my friend's mother was a smoker. She lived this. <coughs> hey, son, I don't want you to smoke. Okay. Train up. Let me finish the sentence here. Okay. Listen to this. When you're on the road, when you're going to bed, the best thing in the world. I, love, I miss this so much. Giving my children bedtime stories. I'd lit, I'd read the Bible with them. By the way, a great Bible to get is the Action Bible. It's awesome. Anyhow, so I'm reading the child. Oh, I fall asleep. I'm telling them a story, and I'm talk, talking gibberish. The kids start laughing about the stuff. I, to this day, they laugh about Sally the Salamander. I, I made up some crazy story to my daughter, and she still remembers that. Dad, remember the time you fell asleep and you said it? And to this day, they remember. It's such a beautiful thing, right? Talk about it when they go to bed. Reminders, write them on the doorpost. Tie them on your hands. In other words, everything you do, when you do your work, uh, <clears throat> uh, you go to a restaurant, uh, uh, kids under 12 eat for free. Your child is turning. Just turned 13 two days ago. <laughs> Surely it's fine. What does it tell your kid? You can fudge the rules. Let's not talk about speed limits. <laughs> Train up a child. In the way he should go. Not the way you want him to go. Not that he wanted to be a football player or a scholar, a road scholar. Maybe God has made your child to be a farmer. Maybe God's made your child to be the best janitor there ever was. No matter what my children do, I am proud of them. As long as they do their best, I'll still love them and still be happy for them. They need to know that you will love them no matter what. No matter what they do, I will always love them. I may not accept what they're doing, but I will always love them. I ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. Lord Jesus, I recognize today, as I'm talking about this and preaching this today, Lord, I stand here hardly a great, perfect parent. But Father, you're the perfect parent. You're the one that laid down your life for us. Father, we thank you that there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So Lord, anyone to hear my voice today and they, they felt like it's too late and they, they made a mistake, Lord, I pray that they would make it right. Thank you, Father God, even our mistakes. If we'll surrender our mistakes to you, you said all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purposes. Even when we surrender our trash, you can make it a treasure. And so, Lord, I pray right now for encouragement for everyone here in Jesus' name. Lord, help us to be good parents. Help us to encourage each other in this crazy time we live.